From a young age, I've always loved two things, horror and animation. But more specifically than that, a particular obsession I had as a kid was with the practice of stop motion. The art of slowly manipulating physical objects frame by frame to create movements through a series of pictures in the same way an animator creates and flips through drawings. I don't know why I grabbed my attention like it did, but from the first time I saw it, I was entranced. I guess there was just something about the way it moved, how weighty and durable it looked compared to 2D. It was just so much different than the other animated show I'd seen previously. It felt real since, well, it was real, and though films made with stop motion had been coming out less and less around the time I got into it, that fascination appealed to me so much that, no joke, the first film I ever saw in theaters was Coraline. I was four years old, and I loved it. I can't remember too well what my reaction to it was when I first saw the film, but I have a vivid memory of me talking about how great it was with my mom after we got out, and she said to me, eh, I don't know, I thought it was kind of scary, and that's when I discovered horror. So you better believe that when I saw ads for Laika's next feature, Paranorman, I went and saw it in theaters as soon as possible. And you know what? I loved Paranorman even more than Coraline. And though people often like to say Coraline was superior in quality, I still think Paranorman is peak. And though it technically isn't a Halloween movie, not having a specified date for when it's set and coming out in August, c come on, it works. And I want to gush about it, so like... Shut up. This is why Paranorman is a subversive masterpiece, though I'm probably not going to name it that because Shea Frillis had the same title for his Megamind video, but... Uh... So what's Paranorman about? Well, from first impressions, the gist audiences are supposed to assume is that Norman, an outcast kid obsessed with zombie movies who can talk to ghosts, finds out from his uncle that a witch who cursed the town hundreds of years ago is kept from waking up every year by reading a spell to her. And now that the uncle is dead, Norman has to fill in for him and keep the witch at bay. But of course, he fails, and zombies come back from the dead, so now Norman has to save the town from them and put the witch back to sleep. That's the description everyone associates with Paranorman, and for anyone that hasn't seen it, that sort of vague summary is written intentionally for reasons other than stating what the film was about. It's a deception. Not to say all of what it's describing is untrue, but to say the least, it's not a cut and dry scenario. And that's not the only place it's present. The marketing before the film came out was deceptively edited and framed like it was your average run of the mill goofy kids film with a like a twist to make it just a bit darker. They even got that narrator guy from all those generic cast 2000s kids movie trailers. Paranorman in eye popping 3D rigid PG. Everyone, from semi-interested new viewers to die-hard fans of the studio, were led to believe it was sort of dark for a kid's film, but more bare-bones than the psychological horror elements of Coraline, and the film itself plays out that way for the first act. The seemingly basic story is flat-out explained by the uncle and townspeople. This evil witch cursed the town to damnation, so Norman has to carry on the tradition of keeping her curse at bay or the townspeople are doomed. And outside of the story, the comically archetypal cast is also meant to lull you into believing this is a by-the-book semi-horror film. There's the air-headed jock, the bully, the valley girl older sister, Sister, the fat friend, the dad who doesn't like these doggone hoodlums with their saggy pants and their boomy boxes, the nerdy girl, and of course, the kid that no one understands. It's all to trick the audience in a subtle way, and it makes the twist of the film way more shocking when it happens. But to talk about that twist, I need to mention how it was set up, and boy, if you needed more proof to show just how well written this movie is, it simultaneously finds a way to bamboozle its audience into believing it'll follow a particular narrative so they can then flip the whole thing on its head, and at the same time, it leaves small footprints and breadcrumbs to hint at the twist, though it does doesn't become apparent until retrospectively after the twist happens, which is the best way of foreshadowing there possibly is. Honestly, as a culture, we don't talk enough about the sheer effort it takes to not only foreshadow in a film or TV show, but do it in a way that's either so intentional you laugh when it turns out they were being serious, or as most people are trying to do, isn't so obvious it becomes predictable what's going to happen. For instance, one of the best pieces of foreshadowing I've seen in media is the uses of a literal key in Attack on Titan. In the first episode, we see it around the MC's dad's neck before he leaves, then suddenly, the key ends up around the MC. I won't go into detail about where that rabbit hole goes, but though it seemed sort of inconsequential and weird at the time, a few seasons later it leads to one of the biggest twists of that show, and so in retrospect we understand how he got the key when he supposedly didn't interact with his dad again. But that's a more direct, concrete style of foreshadowing called Chekhov's gun, whereas Paranorman wants to keep the audience from fully guessing the twist until it's already happened, so the writers use more indirect, figurative foreshadowing that adds up over time. Like when the kids are working on a play regarding the witch's trial, the brainy girl mentions how it isn't historically accurate. But the theater teacher, and by extension the town, doesn't care about being historically accurate as long as they can make money off it. And that helps serve as a subtle hint that the story of the witch and her trial has been greatly exaggerated and bolstered over time to make for greater tourist potential. Hell, a good portion of the opening shots of the film are dedicated to showing all the various tourist attractions related to witches. And all of this makes a lot of sense when the real story of the witch is revealed. Plus, before we know the true story, if you've got some knowledge of Salem and Concord, two cities that also exaggerate witch culture for the sake 
sake of tourism. You might recognize that Norman City is based off of them and could theoretically connect the dots. Not to mention it said that ghosts and spirits are only around if they have unfinished business or died horribly, so either way there's already an implication that the witch has more to her than meets the eye. And what might that be? <laughs> Child abuse. Okay, not really. At least not in the way you're thinking of. The truth of the situation is that the witch, who up to this point has been portrayed in the stereotypical black gown, green skin look by the townspeople, was actually a little girl named Agatha who had a special gift, being an ancestor of Normans. She could talk to dead people and had incredible power, but that led to people fearing her, so she isolated herself more, and eventually the townspeople got so fearful they wanted to hang her as a witch after previously killing her mother. On instinct, she cursed all the townsfolk that spoke against her in court to damnation for their actions, and that's why they arose as zombies when the spell, which was just a fairy tale meant to keep Agatha asleep, another bit of foreshadowing as to what the witch truly was, wasn't used in time. The zombies aren't the vengeful undead trying to wreak havoc and eat brains, they're just people that Norman alone can understand so they go after him. It just looks like they're going after anyone because we only see it happening from Norman's perspective, and if you pay attention during the scenes where the zombies are supposedly terrorizing the townsfolk and some characters state as much, they aren't really doing that at all. They're purely attempting to find Norman and not doing anything to anybody, much like the old against Agatha, it's actually the townspeople who decide to fear what they don't understand, and instead of trying to think rationally about the situation or what the zombies are actually doing, they assume it's for nefarious purposes and rile up into a mob. That's when you realize, the curse was never to harm the descendants of the jury that prosecuted Agatha, it was to harm the jury themselves by never letting them be at peace and facing the same ostracization and ridicule she had to endure from them when she didn't do anything wrong. But that doesn't mean the jury or the townsfolk are the street of villains here either. Yes, they both made ignorant ignorant assumptions and went with their gut feelings leading to them doing terrible things, but fear is a hell of a motivator, and that modern day zombie side of the allegory really helps in showing the audience the perspective of the jury that found Agatha guilty. If we saw zombies rising from the dead in this day and age, there would be no ifs, ands, or buts, they're gonna get shot on sight, no questions asked. And that's why the opening of the film depicting Norman's obsession with zombies is such a great touch and way of starting it all. It's almost like the film was reminding us, if we somehow forgot, that this is how zombies are perceived in pop culture nowadays, and the ghost of Norman's grandma even offhandedly says that if they talked it out, things would be different, and I know it's the most obvious bit of foreshadowing in the film, but goddamn, it still works so well, especially if you haven't seen it before. But back to what I was saying, the point of this establishing scene is to give us insight into how the jury of the 18th century viewed any form of witchcraft. They wouldn't have wondered about it, tried to figure out why it was happening, or any of that. They'd think the witch was out to get them, so they'd go and get her before the getting was gotten by them. And it'd be equally easy to portray them as monsters in the same way we were initially led to believe Agatha was, but they aren't. And that keeps Paranorman from falling into a narrative fallacy, knowing that fear controls all people, and in real life, two-dimensional villains are near non-existent, but the idea of them can be created. Which is a theme amplified by the way Agatha and Norman share so many experiences, merely separated by time and level of severity. Though the townspeople haven't exactly called Norman a necromancer and tried to hang him from the gallows for being weird, at least not until the third act, he does clearly face a good level of discrimination from pretty much everyone he knows, and that's led to him being a timid kid that expects he'll never be hurt. He's kind of quiet and unassuming, despite his interest in the dead, and part of why he's embraced zombie culture so heavily could be because the town's labeled him the talks to dead people kid, so he's internalized it as an interest of his to make it come off more natural. And going back to the opening scene, what's the first way we see him? In the dark, watching a zombie movie with no one but his dead grandma watching over him. His living family doesn't know how to communicate or understand him, so they don't really try, and in turn, Norman has isolated himself, taking everything as it comes and not getting bothered when he's bullied. In fact, there's a great little detail of how when Norman sees writing on his locker, he opens it to bring out cleaning supplies and wipe it off, subtly showing to us that he's gotten so used to being picked on, it's become second nature to him. He'd basically be in the process of turning into the next Agatha, a scared kid shaped by society's tendency to belittle and shame outcasts, if he didn't have any supportive figures or friends to keep him from becoming bitter and resentful. One of them is his grandma, obviously, and the other is Neil, who, unlike most fat, geeky, best friend type characters, doesn't start out being Norman's friend. Rather, he's a kid that tries to hang out with Norman, who, at first, doesn't pay Neil any attention, but comes around to liking him by the end of the film, having realized the importance of those kind of friendships by seeing what happened to Agatha. And that again shows us a parallel between the 18th century and modern day characters to explain how they reached the conclusions they did. Disregarding time differences and cultural fears, what Agatha fundamentally lacked that Norman had was a support system. At one point, her mother was there to guide her, but she was ripped away from Agatha by the same jury that convicted her, so she lost a part of her humanity, and with no one to comfort her, it got worse and worse. She was a monster created by the society 
that deemed her as such, and her curse, meant to get back at those that harmed her, only fueled that exaggeration of who she was. So like Norma leaned into his obsession with the dead, Agatha subconsciously leaned into her role as a villain, becoming a bigger bully than the jury ever was in the process. So in the end, it would make sense that Norman, as the only person in town who knows what she had to deal with, would be the only person that could get through to her on her level. Previously, I also mentioned the fact that Norman and Agatha are related, but I should clarify that that's never directly spelled out, and instead made through inferences, seeing as Agatha has the same last name as Norman's uncle, who is the brother of his mom, who would have given up her maiden name after being married, which explains why Norman and Agatha don't have the same last name. Knowing that the two are related is more of a continuity thing for the audience, so we can understand where Norman's powers came from in the first place, though, since Norman knowing he's related to Agatha wouldn't do anything to change the situation. Honestly, I think the reason for their relation never being outright stated is so that when Norman finally interacts with Agatha, he speaks to her as someone who shared similar experiences, rather than a descendant trying to put her to sleep. After all, Norman's family has been responsible for keeping her at rest for generations, so if he came to her as one of those people, she might have never opened up to him. But she did open up for another outcast. They connected over the figurative relationship instead of their more literal one, and in a way, that again subverts another trope of descendant of evil being has to stop them because it's their destiny, by never explicitly bringing up the fact that they're related in the story, since that isn't the focus or point. All the familial connection does, for those that notice, is continues to subvert common tropes whilst giving an explanation of Norman's abilities, and going outside of the film's clever, mature writing, I'd argue the film's subversive quality is also present in the medium of animation they decided to tell the story in, which both gives it a unique look and creates symbolic imagery that never could have looked as good in any other form. Though it's also most likely a big reason why you may not have heard of this up till now. Hey, and by the way, just as a quick aside, do not click off. This is not an advertisement. I just wanted to give a quick update and say that we finally have some merch. I know you guys have been asking for it for, like, multiple years now, and I finally got some on Crowdmade. We got shirts, hoodies, a cool-ass embroidered beanie, some stickers, we got two designs so far, and I think that they both turned out pretty well. And if you guys end up liking this and ordering, maybe we could do some more designs. But yeah, that's all I had to say. But back to the video. Just check it out on Crowdmade. You see, outside of commission work from other studios, stop motion in this day and age is a wholly thankless profession in the animation world. Way back in the 60s and 70s, it was considered a go-to for specials and TV and all that, but with technology advancing like it does, soon enough the medium, in the eyes of corporate executives at least, lost value, and so after it stopped being the most efficient way to animate, the art of stop motion in mainstream media turned into a novelty. Studios barely do stop motion films anymore, TV even less. Really, the near singular way stop motion motion's been able to stay alive as long as it has is thanks to commercials, which stop motion studios still get plenty of work from, and that makes sense. When a studio's hired to do the animation for a commercial, there's no potential loss for the animation studio itself. They create the product as asked, make money for their work, and because someone else is funding the project, it's no money down for the animation studio, seeing as they were contracted rather than directly associated. But that all goes away when the studio independently wants to make a movie. Stop motion films will always cost an exorbitant amount of money. Not not only for the amount of work done, but for how long it will take to do. Sure, you can add in CG or 2D elements to help lighten the load when possible, but for the most part, stop motion is not a process that can be automated. You can automate the process of creating the puppet to an extent, you can automate details, but for the actual movement of the characters, building of sets, shot composition, in its purest form, it's all gotta be done by hand, and that's why it went out of fashion. One person can build a model and setting and all that by themselves in a computer. They don't need another person to make a metal puppet and mold it with clay or plastic or whatever. They can create a 3D plane to put their characters in and shift the perspective by just moving the virtual camera to a different angle. There's a ton of time that can be saved thanks to modern animation tech and know-how. With stop motion, there's only so much that can be done to make it easier. And that's another part of why they don't come out nearly as frequently as other animated films. It's a whole process. And the longer it takes for that process to finish, the more impatient producers get about seeing a return on their investments. Plus, even with all that work put in, stop motion has hardly ever been so profitable. You want to know the biggest stop motion film since the year 2000? Chicken Run. It made $220 million. For reference here, the biggest animated film since 2000, Frozen 2, because I will never count The Lion King 2019, made $1.45 billion, as in $1,450 million. Hey Braxton, that's cheating, that came out in 2019. Oh, alright. How about the highest grossing animated film of the year Chicken Run came out? It made $350 million. Do you want to know what it was? 
Dinosaur, a movie that sucked shit. My point is, stop motion takes a long time to produce, is often a labor of love, isn't very marketable for some reason, and though it might get a cult status and make some profit after the fact, it'll almost always be a loss for the studio. So if you, by some miracle, find a way to make a modern stop motion animated, widely theatrically released, big budgeted film, it better be a story worth telling. And Paranorman provides that in spades, so the attention to detail and love put into the visuals was completely warranted. Serving as the first stop motion film to use a color 3D printer for its characters' faces, Paranorman was able to do more work at a faster pace, and is a technical improvement from Coraline in basically every way. For one, there's more variation in body type, which can be a bitch to animate in stop motion depending on the size, so to account for that and make the movement as solid as possible, they created different mechanisms to simulate the physics of how fat sloshes around. Similarly, with the greater advantage they had in face construction, the crew were able to make more characters more expressive, so when you put the two aspects together, it overall makes for way more individually unique body language, and that's important when so many of the characters have such big personalities in the film. There's no slacking in the personality of the film's cinematography either, having several incredibly ambitious shots and sequences for a stop motion film, including a high-speed car chase, weird moments of distorted gravity, and several impressive-looking daydreaming scenes, all of which required super large, detailed sets to pull off, and I have no idea how they created some of these absolutely breathtaking tracking shots, but my hat is off to them regardless, they're truly amazing. Same can be said about the integration of other animation mediums in the film that blend so seamlessly. Most specifically, Agatha uses a blend of stop motion for her body, CG to create different lighting effects and whatnot, and 2D for the lightning coming off of her. She's really a testament to the technical Marvel Paranorman is, and the combination of so many unique styles helps in making her look uncanny and otherworldly compared to the other characters. But really, it's all the little details that, to me, show the crew's passion better than anything else. If you pay attention to the background of almost any scene, there's a hidden gag or original asset to flesh it out. The way a couple of the ghosts Norman talks to have varying implications of how they died, the weird bits and pieces in the uncle's cabin, all of Norman's randomized zombie memorabilia, I love the attention to detail, and that's a good way to sum up the film, a meticulously crafted, subtle but nuanced, oftentimes humorous film made with the idea in mind that people will understand all the little details the screenwriters and animators threw in. You might not catch everything on your first or second or third watch through, but that's what makes it fun to keep rewatching. It's the perfect seasonal film with a resonant message to watch every year around Halloween. It may not be set during the holiday, meaning you could theoretically watch it at any time during the year, go ahead, you can be one of those Nightmare Before Christmas people and make Paranorman a Christmas film, I don't know. But you know exactly what kind of vibe it has, don't lie to me. It's meant to be seen this season. So what do you still do at watch this video? Go out and find it. Streaming services, Blu-ray, HD DVDs, VHS, Laserdisc, I don't give a shit! Just, just find it. Go, go be spooky. Just, just do it. Please. I'm gonna just stop. See you in the next video.